just to say that I'm not from the community of information theory and computational science and computer science. So I'm more from the community of machine learning and high dimensional statistics. But when I was asked to give a talk here, yeah, so I have chosen one of my recent works, which I think fits the most to, to the uh, topics of this workshop. So I will talk about the problem of sampling from a density in a, a multi-dimensional situation. And I was asked to start with, I mean, at least the first part of more my talk, I was asked to give a very simple one. So please forgive me if it is too simple. Um, so the main goal is the following one. We, we are given a probability density function pi of p uh, of dimension p, and we would like to generate a random number, capital X, which is drawn from pi, which means that the probability of X to belong to any set A com is, can be computed as the integral of pi over the set A. And let me start by a very simple warm-up, which kind of motivates the uh, subsequent study. If we do it with our basic knowledge in probability theory, we would say, OK, I have a problem of simulating from a, from a density. The first thing to which we will uh, think about is to, to use the, pro the, the method of the inversion of the probability distribution function. Actually, it works in the one-dimensional situation. And if you have a multivariate density and you want to sample from this multivariate density, the simplest thing to do is to use the rejection sampling algorithm, which is summarized here. So in order to apply this rejection sampling algorithm, you have to choose an auxiliary density function that I denote here nu of x, such that the target density pi is upper bounded by a constant m multiplied by nu of x for every x. And once this auxiliary density function is chosen, so it has to be a density function such that it's very easy to sample from nu. For instance, you can take, a, say, the uniform density on a, uh, on a simple set. And then the rejection method acts as follows. So it's an iterative method at each step. Uh, so you first sample independently a random variable y from the density nu, and another random variable u, which is uniform on the interval 0m. And then if u is smaller than pi divided by nu, uh, evaluated at y, then we accept the value y and we set x equal to y. And if this inequality is not true, then we reject y and we go back to the step one. And we repeat this until getting acceptance. And it's very easy to see that if we denote by k the number of rounds required to get acceptance, then this capital K is a random variable which is, which is distributed according to the geometric distribution with parameter small p. And small p here is the probability of having the acceptation at the first round, which means that it's the probability of the event that u is smaller than pi of y divided nu of y. And the very simple computation shows that this quantity is just equal to 1 over, one over m. Okay. Um, and basically, it means that if we compute the average number of rounds, which is just the expectation of k for uh, a random variable which is generated, which is distributed according to the geometric distribution, we know that the expectation is 1 over the parameter, so we get capital M. Okay, so if we use in the any setting the rejection method, we know that the average complexity of the resulting algorithm will be equal to capital M, and capital M is here the, the constant which uh, somehow represents the supremum norm of the ratio of the target density over the uh, auxiliary density nu here. And the, so it's a very nice method, but if we apply it in a high dimensional situation, in most situations we see that it doesn't really work well. Why? Because the number of steps required to get acceptance is extremely large. And it is basically 
due to the fact that this constant capital M in the high dimensional situation grows exponentially fast in P. So if P is a dimension, M is typically an exponential function of P. Just to uh, show a simple example which explains why this constant is exponential in P, let us consider the case where we try to sample from a uniform distribution over a compact set included in 0, 1 to power p. Okay, so let C be this compact set and we want to sample from a distribution or from a density function which is proportional to the indicator of this set C. Okay, so the, this strange sign here stands for the proportionality. So it's equality up to a multiplicative constant. Um, of course, if we know the volume Vc of the, of the set C, I'm sorry, this C should be a script C like here. So if we know the volume of this set C, then the problem is trivial. We can directly generate from this uh, density function. But let us assume the case where the set C is somewhat complex. We cannot compute its volume, but still we want to generate a random variable from the uh, uniform distribution over C. The only thing generally which is assumed to be known in such a setup is uh, a positive number r such that there is a ball of radius r included in c. Okay, so we know that c is not too small. So then usually we will choose as the auxiliary density, the uniform density over 0, 1 power p. And in such a situation, in most cases, the best thing that we can do is to choose capital M equal to 1 over the, the volume of this ball of radius R, which is included in C. Okay. And it's clear that th this volume decreases exponentially in P. Okay, here R is usually smaller than 1 because we are 0, 1 to power P. So this volume decreases exponentially fast in P, so this M increases exponentially fast in P. Okay. So this is a very simple computation in the case of this rejection sampling, uh, but this kind of argument holds also for many Ma Ma Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. Uh, for instance, for Metropolis Hastings algorithms, all the known bounds uh, written in this simple situation imply that the number of steps uh, required to get acceptance is exponential in P. No, actually there's a uniform density here, phi of x. So I wrote it, it's proportional to the indicator of x belonging to C, but it's exactly equal to 1 over the volume of C multiplied by the indicator of x belonging to c. Okay. So this is the precise form of the uniform distribution over the compact set. Okay. And if you want phi of x to be bounded by some constant m, multiply the indicator of the set 0, 1 to power p. Okay. Basically, you have to take this constant m uh, equal to 1 over the volume of C. Okay. But you cannot do this because you don't know the volume of C. The only thing that you know is that C contains a ball of radius R in dimension P. So the thing that you, the inequality that you use is that the volume of C is then larger than the volume of VRP. So you take as m the constant, which is this one, that you can compute. And this one is much more difficult to compute. Okay. Any other question? So please feel free to interrupt me. I think that uh, I don't. Yeah, of course. So it will be made clear in the next slides, of course. Uh, so so, so what, what I can. Sorry? You don't need the volume, exactly. You don't need the volume, but then, I mean, we have seen the, condu uh, con the conductance in the, in the previous talk. You, you, you have to control such kind of 
characteristics as the conductance or the mixing time, and all the known results imply, I mean, at least for this very simple Markov chains, they imply exponential time in dimension. Okay, let me now uh, describe the precise setting in which I will be dealing. Uh, uh, so, to keep things simple, we assume that we have a log concave density on Rp. Uh, so, we will define F theta to be the minus log of our target density pi. And we'll assume that this function f uh, satisfies two important conditions. The first one is a, a log convexity, strong log, a strong convexity assumption, sorry, which is so written here, it's quite standard. Uh, the second one assumes that the function f here is smooth. Basically, it's, it just means that the gr gradient of f is Lipschitz with the Lipschitz constant capital M. So this capital M is nothing to have with the capital M of the previous slide. Um, and the goal here is not to sample exactly from the target distribution pi, but to sample nearly from the target distribution pi. So we are given a precision level epsilon. It's uh, some value that we choose beforehand. And then we are trying to build an algorithm which samples from a uh, density mu such that the total variation distance between mu and the target density pi is bounded by epsilon. Okay. So this is our goal. And of course, the goal is to solve this task in an efficient manner, which means that we would like to have an algorithm which has a computational complexity, which is both polynomial in p and in 1 over epsilon. With a power of polynomial which is as small as possible. And it's very important to make the parallel here with the problem of the optimization because actually I came to this problem from, a stat from statistical considerations and in statistics uh, you, you are usually facing this problem where you consider the Bayesian setup, you have um, posterior distribution and you want to sample from your posterior distribution. But an alternative to this is to compute the log posterior and to maximize it, which leads to the well-known maximum likelihood estimator or the maximum a posterior estimator. And in terms of the, of the notations that I have introduced on the previous slide, it, it amounts to computing the theta star which is the mode of the density pi, or equivalently, it's the minimum point of this function f, which is the so-called log likelihood here. And a very basic result in the theory of optimization tells us that if you apply the very simple gradient descent algorithm, the uh, update rule is written here. You start from some theta zero, and then you, you go uh, so you move in the direction which is opposite to the gradient at each step, which is step size equal to 1 over 2m, just to keep things simple, then it's well known that the, the, the value that you will get at the case iteration uh, is close to the initial, to, is close to the optimal solution up to epsilon if the number of iteration is larger than this quantity here. So it's a very clear, clean result and a very interesting one because the first observation that we can uh, make here is that there is no dimension. Okay. So the number of rounds needed to achieve epsilon accuracy is independent on dimension. Of course, at each iteration you have to do a number of computations which are roughly proportional to p, to the dimension, because you, I mean, you have a gradient to compute in many situations. You have a function of p variables. Even the evaluation of one function involves p computations. Okay. So each iteration is roughly or has a computational complexity uh, proportional to the dimension p, but the number of iterations is independent on the dimension, and it depends only logarithmically on 1 over epsilon, which is the precision target precision level. What's, what's the little m here? The little m here is the constant of strong convexity, oh. which was here. Okay, so we assume that the function is strong convex with constant little m and it's smooth with constant capital M. And basically, I mean, 
just to uh, have a s more say, si si simple thing in, uh, in our mind, we can just assume that so M times identity matrix is smaller than the Hessian matrix of F of X, and it's smaller than capital M times identity matrix. So it's of dimension P for every X. Um, so this is a very simple result from the theory of optimization. And I mean, our, our starting point was that why uh, we should have such a simple result in the optimization and do not have an equivalent one in the problem of sampling from density. Um, so the goal is to establish something which is more or less similar. Of course, the problem of sampling from density is much more difficult, so we, can, I mean, we were, uh, it was clear for us from the beginning that we will not have something as clean as in the situation of the optimization. But let us uh, look at a couple of results which were kind of the state of the art in the theory of sampling from a, from a distribution or from density. So, there are many results. I will not cite all of them. Uh, I've chosen just a couple of results which really I mean, allow me to make the point. Uh, and this one, I think that I've included this because there is a field medalist as co-author here. Uh, so let us look at the main theorem of this result in which the authors try to solve exactly the same problem. So they consider uh, an algorithm which is called MALA, so Metropolis Adjusted Langevin Algorithm. I will come to this in a couple of slides, but let us consider just there is an algorithm here. They have exactly the same problem of sampling from the density pi, which is just the exponential of minus f of x. There are some conditions here, and they uh, show that if we look at the result at the case iteration of this Markov chain, then the total variation distance between this density and the target density is upper bounded by something which is very nice because let us forget this term. Here we see that it goes exponentially fast to zero with k. So if you want to get a bound epsilon here, k should be log of one over epsilon, something like that. Okay, so it's a very nice thing and there is no dimension involved in this result. So the first uh, thing that we can say, the first consequence that we can draw from this result is that, I mean, the things are as nice in the problem of sampling as in the problem of the optimization. The problem here, I mean, there are at least two problems. The first one is this sentence here. So there exist positive constants rho, C1 and C2, such that this inequality holds. Okay. So there is nothing about rho, C1 and C2. In particular, this rho, this c1 and this c2, may depend on the dimension p. And they do depend on the dimension p. So in all these kind of results, the dimension is assumed to be fixed, and all the constants are constants that depend on the dimension. Um, so this is the first drawback of such kind of results. And the second one is this one under some natural assumptions. And then, uh, if you look at the, the natural assumptions, here are the natural assumptions. Okay, so you have many assumptions. I think that for most people, these assumptions are far from being natural. And uh, at least, I mean, there is a look just the first assumption here, the function u, which is actually the function f in their notation. Uh, so the function f is assumed to be four times continuously differentiable. And then there are many, many, many other assumptions with many, many different constants, which all depend on the dimension and all, uh, many other things. But they depend also on this small m, the capital M. And I mean, it's very difficult to really to, to understand from this result uh, how the number of iterations to perform depends on the dimension and all the different parameters characterizing the function f. Uh, Another very famous result is the one by uh, Laszlo Dovash and Santosh Vempada, 
uh, maybe many of you have already uh, seen such a result because they have a number of papers devoted to this subject which are very famous. And I like very much their paper because they were, in my opinion, uh, the first to prove that if you have a, a low concave density then in Rn or in Rp, then you can sample from this density in a polynomial time. And actually the polynomial time, so their results, I mean, written here, if I translate it into the notations that I have used so far, basically they say that if the number of iterations is larger than some, some constant, multiply the dimension to power 4, and then you have this term here, then your sample uh, distribution will be close to the target one up to the level epsilon here. Okay, so it's exactly the setting we are interested in, we are interested in but the main uh, problem for me here is this 10 to power 31. Can you really say that this 10 to power 31 is a constant? I'm, it is from a mathematical point of view, but uh, it's a large constant, exactly. Uh, uh, and actually, I have, uh, I'm the responsible of a master program here in Paris, and I have a lot of students who are doing their internship in different uh, companies. And they are very often using Mart of J. Monte Carlos for computing different things. And they often write me emails or come to my office and ask, OK, I have an MCMC algorithm. I have looked in the literature. I find this one, which is, uh, which I mean, seems to be the optimal one in the literature. And they say, you run it until, until the convergence. And I, I, I'm running it, and I don't know whether it converges or not. So how can I decide? if it converts or not. And I mean, from a theoretical point, the only answer that I can give is that, I mean, it's up to you to decide whether it converts or not. There is no clear rule saying that your algorithm converts. And this one is a very nice rule from a theoretical point of view, but you can, can never apply it. Even if, even if dimension is equal to five, you can never apply this rule, okay? And, but, for me, the, the very nice thing is this result is this p to power 4, and this, this logarithm to power 5 of a constant times p divided by epsilon. So basically, it tells us that uh, you can always have a Markov chain which uh, generates up to epsilon from the target pi uh, with a computational complexity which is polynomial in p and log polynomial or polylog in 1 over epsilon. Yeah, just to complete so the discussion of this slide, the algorithm which is shown to achieve this rate is the hit and run algorithm, which basically says that you, so you sample, I mean, so it's an iterative algorithm. Uh, if you consider that you have, so it's mainly used for sampling from a compact set from uniform distribution on, over a compact set. And if you are at some point here, you choose randomly a direction you draw this segment up to the intersection with the frontier of the, of the set, and then you, you draw the, the, the next, so it's x of n, and you draw the next one, x n plus 1, just by considering the restriction of your multivariate distribution over this one-dimensional uh, segment here. Okay, so um, an iterative algorithm, a Markov chain, which uh, mix is quite fast. Um, but so one of the observations when uh, so we have looked at this literature is that so these results also the, they are in spirit very close to the results existing in the optimization theory. The algorithms which are used for obtaining these results, so for instance, this hit and run algorithm, is very different from the algorithm used in the optimization theory. But there is this the, the very well known Langevin Monte Carlo method, which basically is a randomized version of the gradient descent. And a natural question whether we can prove also such strong convergence properties for this uh, Langevin Monte Carlo. So let me now describe this Langevin Monte Carlo method. Uh, so we start from theta zero, which is our initial point. So it's a point chosen. I mean, the 
in, in all our theoretical results, I will assume that the initial point is just the mode of the, of the density, the, the point that minimizes the function f. Uh, but basically, it can be, for, for the algorithm, it can be anything. So you start from theta 0, and you just perform this gradient descent here with the step size h. But you, so in order to converge not to the minimal point, but to a random, but to a probability distribution, you have to add some random perturbation here. And the perturbation is just uh, a scalar factor here, which has to be square root of two times the step size multiplied by a random vector, which is just a Gaussian, this, uh, a Gaussian this drawn from a Gaussian distribution of dimension p with zero mean and with identity covariance matrix. Okay, so you have just a Gaussian white noise here. So this is the standard Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. It is well known in the, um, so in the, in the theory that this Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm uh, defines a Markov chain uh, which, so under the conditions that we have imposed on f, is um, reversible and the invariant density of this Markov chain is exactly equal to our density pi. And there is a second version, a more uh, less famous one of this Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm which is called Langevin Monte Carlo with Ozaki discretization. Uh, which slightly modifies this gradient term. So instead of multiplying just by a scalar factor h, we multiply by a matrix M here, where M involves a slightly complicated expression with hk here denoting the Hessian matrix of the function f. And it's the same for the, for the noise term here. We have to multiply it by some covariance matrix, which involves, once again, the Hessian matrix evaluated at the previous step of the iteration. So this algorithm here is a kind of first order, order method, which, because it involves only the first order derivative of f. And the LMCU algorithm is the second order method. So you can, just to do the parallel with the optimization, you can uh, think about this one as the standard gradient descent, and the second one as the Newton method. And so the question now is, how can we choose the step size h here and here, and the number of iterations so that the iterate of number k has a density close to the target density pi within the prescribed level epsilon? Is it clear? Um, so, so before going to the details, let me just summarize our main findings, and then I will explain more precisely how these results are obtained and what are the main ideas be behind this Langevin Monte Carlo and Langevin Monte Carlo with Ozaki discretization. Uh, so first of all, if we consider only the functions which are strongly convex, the notation O star has already been introduced during the previous talk, so it's so all the logarithmic factors are hidden inside here. Uh, so if we consider the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm, the number of steps step necessary to reach the level epsilon is uh, proportional to the dimension divided by epsilon squared, and just to 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 be clear, I. I've written here the number of computations necessary at each step, and it's roughly proportional to p, okay, to the dimension of the, on, the, uh, on the vector. Um, if we apply this LMCO algorithm, so the second order version, we will have a number of iterations proportional to dimension divided epsilon. So instead of dividing by epsilon square, we divide by epsilon. So it's, it mixes faster. but the drawback here is that we have to compute the Hessian, and furthermore, we have had the see, we have had the exponential of the Hessian here. In order to compute this expo exponential, we have to basically compute the SVD of the Hessian, which will usually be of complexity p to power three. Okay. 
So each step of iteration is much more costly, uh, but the number of iterations required is smaller. Okay, so if you look at this table, basically it's preferable to use LMCO only when the target precision level epsilon is very small. In all the other cases, it's preferable to use the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. And also, we can adapt this algorithm to the situation where the function is convex but not strongly convex. You have to just add a small penalization term, which is a kind of quadratic with a very well tuned uh, constant factor. And then what you will get is that the number of iterates for uh, getting the level epsilon is p cubed divided by epsilon to power 4. If you use LMC and it's p divided over epsilon to power 2.5 for the LMCO. And so these results uh, have been obtained. So in our paper, which will appear in GRSSB uh, very soon, I hope, and extended in the paper of uh, Alain Durmus and Eric Moulin. Some, some months after that. Okay, let me now explain how these results have been obtained and what are the main mathematical tools behind. Uh, so the first thing to understand is that this Langevin Monte Carlo, algorit Monte Carlo algorithm works well because this sequence, so I will write it here, we have this sequence theta k plus one defined as theta k minus h times the gradient of f and theta k plus square root of 2h multiplied by xi of k plus 1. So this sequence of uh, Langevin Monte Carlo uh, algorithm is basically just a discretization of the Langevin diffusion, which is written here. Okay, so let Wt be a standard Brownian motion, a p variant Brownian motion. Uh, the, the process L of t, which is defined by the stochastic differential equation, is a Markov diffusion process. It's, uh, it has continuous trajectories over each uh, interval, finite interval, zero, say, capital T. And it's well known that if the function f satisfies some assumptions, and in particular, if the function f is strongly convex, then this stochastic differential equation has a unique strong solution. And this solution has very nice mixing properties. In particular, it has an ergo it, it's ergodic with a stationary density which is exactly equal to pi, okay? which is proportional to the exponential of minus f. So basically, uh, what can deduce from this is that if we, if we were able to, to simulate one path of this diffusion process, a continuous path over a very large interval, then the final value of this, of this random process would be a random vector distributed uh, from a density which is very close to pi. Okay. So in order to explain uh, the, the, the rest of the arguments, I will just introduce the, the transition kernel here. I will denote it by PLT, so it's the transition probability uh, of the process L uh, up to time t. Okay, so so it's written here. It's the conditional probability that Lt belongs to A, given that the initial value was equal to small x. And there is a very nice result, which says that if the condition C1 and C2, so this was basically the assumptions of smoothness and strong log convexity of the function f. So if these two conditions hold, then the the, the transition kernel here satisfies the spectral gap property, which means that the, there is a gap between its two, uh, two main eigenvalues. And in, it implies that uh, the process is geometrically ergodic, which means that at time t, the distribution gets close to the target distribution pi at an exponential rate in t. 
Okay, so we have this very nice uh, inequality in which everything is explicit. So if we had really this continuous time uh, observation, so if we were able to to sample a continuous path of L, then we had we could have chosen just this T, so that this quantity is smaller than epsilon, and uh, it would be it would be done. The the, 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 the problem here is that we cannot sample for a continuous path, so we have to discretize. Uh, there are many different ways of discretizing a diffusion process. The simplest one is, of course, to use this Euler discretization, uh, which, uh, so which corresponds simply to taking, um, to, to replacing the function gradient of f here, which is a continuous function by its local constant approximation. Okay, so we have this function gradient of f at lt. So say for zero, which is between uh, for t, which is between zero and capital T. And what we will do here, yeah, we will take this interval zero t. So we will consider the uniform grid here with a step size equal to h. And on each interval here, so we will replace this gradient of f lt by the gradient of f evaluated at l, say, k times h. Kay. So if this point here is k times h. Kay. So over this whole interval, we will replace the gradient by this, this quantity, which doesn't depend on t. And if we do this over the this interval, our diffusion process becomes a Gaussian process because the drift part becomes independent on t. And we come exactly to, to this equation here. Okay? So if we replace the gradient of f by a locally constant function, then we get a new, uh, say, a new process uh, that I have denoted dt, such that this new process dt at the observations times h, 2h, 3h, kh is exactly equal to theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, etc. And so here this bt of d is this local constant approximation of the diffusion process. But we could also have replaced the initial diffusion process or its drift there by the local linear approximation. And if we use this local linear approximation, then we come to the LMCO algorithm. Okay, so the difference between the LMC and the LMCO is just in the way we have discretized the diffusion process. OK, so now when, since we have the, this equality in distribution between these two random vectors, um, we can uh, just use the well-known Pinsker inequality, which bounds the total variation distance by the square root of the kullback leibler divergence. Uh, we can say that if we compare the original diffusion process uh, to the discretized diffusion process, so nu here is the, initial, is the, is the density of the initial uh, point, theta 0. Uh, so we know that the square total variation distance is smaller. Sorry. So here, it's the, the distribution at the point k times h. So the distribution at this point here. And what we, we can say is that the difference between the distributions at point k times h is smaller than the total variation distance between the distributions of the whole path over the interval 0 k times h. Okay. Because we, we extend the, the probability space, so the, the distance will be larger. And once we have the distances between the, the random paths of the, of the processes, we apply 
the piece carrier inequality here, which allows us to upper bound the total variation distance by the kullback Kuhl leibler divergence. And for the kullback leibler divergence, uh, for diffusion processes, there is the explicit formula in terms of the Gerson-Sanoff formula, which tells us that this kullback leibler is equal to the expectation of the L2 norm of the drift. So just applying these two tools, so basically the Pinsker inequality combined with the Gerson-Sanoff formula, we, we manage to, to get the bound that I have summarized in the, in the table. And the precise uh, statement of the theorem is here. So we f first we have to choose the time t, which corresponds to the time horizon we need for sampling uh, our path of the diffusion process. Okay, so this t will not be too small. And in particular, if it's larger than this quantity here, uh, it's fine for us. Uh, once we have chosen the time horizon, we have to choose the step size h here according to this quantity. And if these two uh, parameters t and h is chosen in, such a, in, in this way, then we are sure that the LMC algorithm at time k will sample from a density which is within epsilon of the target density pi. And here we have very simple rules which can be implemented in practice and which lead to uh, computational complexities which are the best known in the literature so far. At least, at least in terms of the dependence on the dimension. Okay, let me just uh, summarize what we did so far and to, to say a couple of words about the future work. So, so first of all, I think that the main uh, message of this work is that um, so if we use these algorithms which, which are very close to the algorithms coming from the optimization theory, we can design some sampling strategies for which we can establish theoretical guarantees which can be used in practice. Um, and it can allow us to avoid very large constants like in the papers by Lovash and Vempala. And we think that there, are, there is some additional work to do in terms of the discretization of these uh, diffusion processes. Uh, in particular, this LMCU algorithm, we have, uh, I mean, we can work a little bit more with the formulas that we have in order to simplify them. In particular, we have had some exponential of matrices. Uh, we can use Taylor expansions for these exponentials in order to simplify this formula. And we believe that the resulting algorithm will be very, I mean, we have already tried some on some simulated data. It works very well. So it would be nice to establish some theoretical results for that algorithm as well. And there is also a setting uh, to which we would like to extend our results in the case where the function f uh, is difficult to evaluate at a point, but we can easily access to some noisy evaluation of the function f or of noisy evaluations of the gradient of f. So it would be interesting to see how the theoretical results um, uh, become, uh, what would become our theoretical results in such a situation. Sorry? Yeah, so in the last case, I mean, you can assume that it's known, but it's written in an integral form, for instance, you know? In, the, in, the, in statistics, there is this very uh, useful model of hidden variables. So if you are in such, um, such models and you cannot have access directly to F, but you can kind of simulate. You can use another Markov, Markov chain Monte Carlo to compute the function f at each point with some noise. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, metric entropy could be a natural, yeah, natural kind of uh, measure of complexity in this case. Yes. 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 <laughs> I mean, this setting is, um, 
has been uh, analyzed in many works in optimization and theory, so that's why also it's relevant to it consider the corresponding results uh, for sampling. Thank you very much. <laughs>